Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mark Levy uh, and I'm the head of the English language programs team of the British Council here in Spain and I'm here at home. I'm about uh, 50 kilometers northwest of Madrid uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you wherever you're joining us from, whether in Spain or anywhere else around the world uh, and I hope you're all safe and well. So welcome to this, which is the third of our three discussion panels aimed at starting new conversations around rethinking key themes in plurilingual ed bilingual education. If you joined us, I know some of you did, for our earlier panels on rethinking assessment and rethinking in inclusion, then you'll know that these are all part of our Empowering Transformational Change Conference, organised around our dual celebration of 80 years of the British Council School and the British Council in Spain, and the 25th anniversary of our National Bilingual Education Programme in collaboration with the Ministry of Education, Ministerio de Educación y Formación Profesional, and 10 of the regional governments. I'm hoping that today's conversation, today's discussion on rethinking quality assurance in plurilingual education is equally as thought provoking as the uh, two that came before. The theme is clearly of central importance to schools and there are questions for all of us to consider. I think we probably all agree that schools should and mainly do try to offer the highest possible quality of education they can to their pupils. But what do we actually understand by quality? And do we share that understanding, not only between schools, but even in schools and within our own school? What steps are necessary to ensure that we understand the impact and the success of our schools? And how can we celebrate and build on what is working and focus effectively on what we could be doing better? We're lucky to have another three gate panelists with us this afternoon who will give us their thoughts on these questions and hopefully more. But before I introduce them, let me just tell you a little bit about how it's going to work. Um, there'll be two parts to the session. So first, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to present for a few minutes to an, on an area related to the theme. And after that, we'll move to questions and answers. For the Q&A, I've already got some questions that some of you have uh, sent in in advance when you registered but we'll also be taking questions during this live session. Um, so if you do have a question at any time, please use the Q&A function. You should see a little box or a speech mark with a question mark. And can you open that and can you use that to write any questions? You can either write to all of the panelists or direct your question to anyone. That's up to you. And if you write those, those, will be, those questions will be passed on to me and I can choose and ask some of them later on. My colleagues behind the scene, Maureen and Rebecca, are looking at the Q&A today and they'll also be uh, posting their links maybe to what people are saying or other things that are of interest that, that tie in with the theme. So do keep that Q&A open. Right, so let's move on to the reason that we're all here and I'm delighted to present three very distinguished panellists with us for this conversation. You'll have seen their full biographies on the website and on the information we sent out, so I'm not going to read through everything again, but I would like to briefly introduce them. The first person to speak will be Catherine Redknapp, and she is Principal Research Officer for the Welsh Language and Welsh, Welsh Government, and she's joining us from Cardiff. Her role is one which involves leading the development and delivery of a programme of research and evaluation to support the Welsh Government's strategy for the Welsh language. And Catherine will then bring, obviously therefore be bringing to our conversation insights from the experience of a different plurilingual context to the one we have in Spain. Speaking after Catherine will be Mercedes, Mercedes Hernández, who's the head of our British Council School in Madrid, uh, and she's joining us from the school uh, in Somos Aguas, and she'll also be bringing with her 30 years of experience in school leadership in the UK. And the third panellist is Sara Pampin, uh, who's head of the Emilio Ferrari Secondary School in Valladolid, uh, which is where she's joining us from. And that's a school that is part of our bilingual education program with the Ministry of Education. And she's here to represent uh, what she does in her school and to represent the program as well. So a warm welcome to all the panelists. Thank you very much for making time for us. Don't forget to use the Q&A to ask your questions and let's make a start with the presentations. So I'd, last to, I'd like to ask Catherine first to talk to us about quality assurance in the context of plurilingual education based on the Welsh medium experience. Thank you, Catherine. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to take part in the discussion this evening. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you and also to learn from my fellow panellists. Uh, my intention is to bring a specific Welsh and Welsh language perspective to the discussion. But as the title of the session indicates, 
that Welsh language dimension can't be considered in a vacuum. And there are some interesting questions around bilingualism and plurilingualism that I'm sure will come up in our conversation. Um, for now, I'll refrain from unpacking or deconstructing the title of the session, um, but it's useful, I think, to begin by reflecting on some of the underlying considerations that appear to be at the core of what we're exploring. Um, at the risk of oversimplifying a complex area of exploration, I would summarise by suggesting that we've reached a juncture where the concept of developing learners' linguistic repertoires has already acquired currency and where alternatives to the notion of journeying towards some perfect competence are already well rehearsed. Uh, practices such as translanguaging and approaches such as um, content and language integrated learning, CLIL, are by now a readily identified feature of language teaching and learning and are continually offering new insights into how skills in one language can support the development of skills in others. This in turn raises interesting questions about the extent to which the wider systemic structures of education and quality assurance mechanisms in particular for the purposes of our discussion facilitate and support this approach to language development. Just to put that in the context of Wales, um, the education system in Wales is characterised primarily by the existence of two languages, Welsh and English with education provision delivered to varying degrees through the medium of both languages. It's the Welsh Government's policy that all pupils should study Welsh from the age of three to 16. The extent to which Welsh is used as a medium of instruction in primary and secondary schools varies according to a number of considerations, some of them relating to the geographical location of the school and the sociolinguistic composition of the area that the school is situated in. It's not always a clear cut distinction between Welsh medium and English medium schools. In some cases, schools offer varying degrees of Welsh medium or English medium provision. And not all pupils in the school will necessarily have the same proportion of their curriculum delivered in both languages. So it's a fairly complex picture um, that I can only sketch out at a superficial level in the discussion today. Um, but just to provide some figures for you to get an understanding of what I'm describing, in 2019 to 20, around a fifth of primary aged children in Wales, that is between the ages of five and 11, were in Welsh medium education. In the secondary sector, pupils in Welsh medium schools represented almost 9% of the student population, with another 11% in bilingual schools. I should add as well that um, the categorisation of schools according to their language provision is not something that can be covered um, in this brief overview. It's important to point out that Welsh medium education in Wales is delivered largely through a process of early immersion. The precise nature of the immersion model varies according to the linguistic circumstances of the learners, but one feature that needs to be mentioned is the fact that learners, regardless of their home language, all undertake their learning in the same Welsh medium classroom setting. Well, the situation I've just outlined sits within the wider education policy in Wales. One of the links I've provided will give you more detailed explanation if this is something you wish to pursue. Um, it also sits within a wider language policy framework. The Welsh Government's strategy for the Welsh language, Cymraeg Daideg Pimdeg, um, has as its vision reaching a million speakers by the year 2050. And um, in 2011, the last census, 562,000 people aged three and over were able to speak Welsh. That's 19% of the population of Wales. The strategy also includes a target relating to Welsh language use, namely the percentage of the population that speak Welsh daily and can speak more than just a few words of Welsh is to increase from 10% in 2013 to 15 to 20% by 2050. The first theme of the strategy relates to increasing the number of Welsh speakers. So the education system and the focus on early immersion and Welsh medium provision is considered to be central to the realisation of the strategy's aims. But Welsh medium education and the aim of enabling learners to become users of Welsh and English in their daily lives can't be seen in isolation. Learners in Wales also study other languages, modern foreign languages, in school. 
The Welsh Government has recently issued its plan to improve and promote modern foreign languages in Wales, Global Futures. As part of a much wider process of curriculum reform in Wales that's currently underway, all aspects of language learning and acquisition will be approached within one area of learning and experience. And that sets out the expectation that all learners will learn at least one international language from primary school. By bringing together languages, literacy and communication within one area of learning, the aim is to enable learners to communicate effectively using Welsh, English and international languages and to encourage learners to transfer what they've learned about how languages work in one language to the learning and using of other languages. So from this brief overview, I hope I've been able to put across the key features of how languages in education are approached in the Welsh context. I'm sure the discussion later will provide an opportunity to explore in greater detail some of the questions that can come to the fore when this is placed in the context of plurilingualism and quality assurance. So that's all for me for the time being. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thanks very much, Catherine. And uh, that's the first uh, use of Welsh in our, in our panel so far as well. So well done. <laughs> Thanks very much. OK, uh, let's move on now to uh, we'll come back to obviously to those themes later on. Uh, next, we'll move on to Mercedes, who's going to explore the question of why schools should want to be involved in their own quality assurance. Thanks, Mercedes. Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction. And, uh, you know, thank you to everybody who's joining us for this discussion. Um, if we could put the presentation on. Um, I wanted to start with uh, um, uh, exploring uh, why we should be uh, involved in quality assurance uh, in schools. Uh, and uh, I believe as somebody uh, who has been involved in education and is passionate about learning uh, that um, the desire to improve is an essential human uh, quality and uh, if you work in education it's also a professional responsibility. This is why the first step of quality assurance which is around self-evaluation uh, should be essential to the life of any school. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. I've lost the presentation now. OK, I will continue talking. Uh, so uh, many educational systems around the world um, uh, have been calling for a, a change uh, and a change in the way um, the evaluation is done in schools and actions uh, should be promoted towards a, uh, a system that allows schools to improve from within. Uh, external uh, ex inspections that many educational systems have used uh, have failed to get to the heart of what the, the schools are really like and uh, have also failed to deliver uh, in the goal of helping schools to improve through uh, critical self-reflection. Uh, this is something uh, that uh, self-evaluation uh, and um, uh, quality assurance uh, that starts in the school setting will help us achieve. There is therefore a balanced uh, approach uh, and a, a difficult balance to be achieved between um, quality assurance that is based on self-evaluation and that that is based around self-inspection. And uh, uh, if the slide was showing, uh, I try to sum up some of the criteria in slide two, please. Um, some of the differences between those two approaches. Uh, whilst uh, the former uh, self-inspection uh, is rigid, uh, it, uh, it is based on judgment, uh, uh, it often is um, uh, critical of uh, the schools in a way that doesn't promote uh, a desire to improve. Um, self-evaluation is led from within um, so that schools engage with a framework that allows them to make decisions uh, and uh, to uh, identify priorities. So to offer the best possible education for learners, schools need to know how well what they are providing is serving the students uh, uh, in that community. They need to know their strengths and they also need to be able to identify the areas for development. And from those areas for development will emerge the priorities for improvement. Uh, therefore, self-evaluation uh, is only effective if it's based in, uh, on a, an openness and honesty and trust. 
um, balancing the desire to highlight barriers to learning um, and with the uh, and the highest standards uh, with what uh, a school needs to be doing in order to uh, to move up uh, their game and to serve the students better. Uh, within schools, therefore, uh, we need to diagnose uh, the strengths and the weaknesses. We need to identify priorities and we need to plan for actions. So that is uh, a big job to undertake. Uh, in the schools. It's a cyclical activity and it adapts constantly to the changes uh, in the schools seeking uh, further improvements. Uh, next slide, please. I believe that a single school can achieve a lot uh, with uh, ambitious improvement plans and priorities, but experience tells us that the greatest gains are achieved through collaborative working. This is where networks are created and uh, so that schools and professionals within schools work together. Uh, they research, uh, they look at educational innovation, uh, they look at transformation uh, and they share knowledge and practice across a wide range of, uh, of schools and stakeholders. And this collaborative networks will create a pool of ideas and resources that support dynamic exchange among the, amongst the participants and will help the schools uh, act on the findings from the quality assurance. Uh, next slide, please. So those school self-evaluation is relatively new. Uh, the mechanisms that we use have been tested in a number of, uh, of countries and the schools and their communities that they serve uh, need to develop through this process a deeper knowledge of how quality assurance processes work and how to move from just asking questions and evaluate uh, to clear strategies that allow the schools to improve. We need to consider many uh, things such as what kind of data, what kind of evidence we look for uh, and move away from the easy to gather uh, quantitative data like exam results to valuing other uh, types of evidence more qualitative around the experience of the students, ask the students, ask the families and ask the community how well the school is doing. Valuing their views and their opinions uh, is really important to this process. As, is, as important as it as is uh, looking at students' work and um, the competencies and skills that they are developing. Um, next slide, please. So going back to the first slide, why should schools want to uh, engage in quality assurance and self-evaluation? It's because schools want to improve and schools are committed, I believe, uh, to serving their communities uh, and leaders uh, are particularly engaged in understanding the route uh, to making the school uh, even better for the learners. Uh, and I'm delighted that the next speaker, Sarah, will talk about some of that journey and, and uh, how uh, it feels in, in the bilingual schools. Uh, and I will be delighted to answer some questions, I hope, later on in the chat. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Mercedes. Um, I mean, you've obviously brought out there an awful lot of themes that we'll come back to afterwards about self-evaluation, inspection, collaborative, learning, uh, evaluation on the basis of exams or or other sorts of experience. Um, so I think we'll come back to a lot of those themes afterwards. Thanks. But let's move on now to uh, the third panelist, and that's Sarah. And Sarah is going to speak to us um, about how her team works to ensure quality in her school and also about her experience in the working group to develop a self-reflection quality assurance tool for our own uh, British Council uh, Ministry of Education bilingual programme. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't see myself typing that I'm in right now. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to the British Council for allowing our school to be part of this panel. It's an honor for us to be here representing the state schools following this program. And it's also a big pleasure for me personally to be sharing this panel with Catherine and Mercedes. And your presentations have been amazing. Well, our school, ES Emilio Ferrari, is located in Valladolid and it was created in 1969. We are currently a high school of secondary education and we have compulsory secondary education. Our students are following the normal curriculum, but they're also following some of them, the ones who decide to do that. They follow the integrated curriculum between the Ministry of Education, as Mark said, and the British Council since uh, 2006. 
Uh, we also have A levels and there are also four higher level vocational training courses. The location of our school means that it welcomes students from a very heterogeneous population, city neighborhoods, and also rural population of nearby villages. And the types of families in each area are very heterogeneous as well, both in age and in socioeconomic context. And this is a fact that can be considered as one of the positive aspects that characterize our school, as it is a focus of attraction for different types of population. Uh, this attraction increases every year. More parents uh, choose our school because of the quality of the bilingual program, because of the academic results, the variety of languages we offer, and the demand of the families towards the education of their children is really very high. So if we can go, yeah, thank you. If we can go to the presentation to the, to the next uh, slide, as my team and I have been analyzing the quality of our bilingual program, uh, not only for this panel, but also uh, in the normal uh, coordination meetings that we have, we have uh, found that it stands on the following aspects. Uh, mainly, this, first of all, it's the student's ability to communicate in the target language and, and their high level of attainment in, in those subjects which are taught in English, which are mainly uh, geography and history, biology and geology, physics and chemistry, arts, and also the proper uh, English subject. Uh, they get very good results in external examinations that they take, such as the IGCSEs or, or even the proper results that they get in the exams that they do to, to access university. Um, we're very lucky to have highly trained teachers with a very good level of English who make the most of the qualities of the students to enhance their abilities. Uh, our teachers are always willing to collaborative work because we know the, the potential of our students. We are learning to open the doors of our classes. We are losing our fear to ask, uh, to ask our class, uh, our colleagues and so on. And the methodologies used by the teachers who have been in the program for a longer period of time, they are used by other colleagues, even from other departments. Uh, we have a very high motivation in our students. And as I said before, we have demanding families who take care and time in their children's education. Uh, students know where they are and they recognize the importance and the effort that they put in studying in a bilingual program. Some of them even define being in it as a way of life for them. Um, we try to encourage innovation and creativity among our students by working in different projects, which are sometimes interdisciplinary between the areas of the program. This also works for the non-bilingual students as well, so it is something that it, it is again a sign and a normal way of working of the whole school. Uh, we also try to have mixed classes. This is another of our identity signs, so bilingual and non-bilingual students, they're, they're studying, learning together from each other. And the experience says to us that both the academic results and the motivation and behaviour work better in those mixed groups. And then we always try to offer a great variety of cultural exchanges and linguistic immersions because we believe that our students need those experiences to achieve their highest level. We always try to participate in as many projects as possible, such as Erasmus Plus or, or many other different kinds. But we're always trying to make things better, as, as Mercedes was saying before. So uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, we have been also very lucky to be selected and collaborate with the British Council in a working group with other primary and secondary schools from different regions in Spain, as, as Mercedes said before. Uh, the objective of this group is to design a self-evaluation tool, which is adapted to the, to the context of bilingual schools in Spain, because we have been studying a different kind of tools from the United Kingdom, but we have been working in trying to adapt that to our own context, right? So as you see in the slide, we have organized this tool into five sections to analyze the, the strengths and the areas of development of, of our bilingual or plurilingual schools. The five areas, as you see there, are uh, self-evaluation for self-improvement, because we really need to demonstrate the impact of self-evaluation in relation with the progress and outcomes of our learners. Uh, the second area is leadership of learning because professional commitment to improve our pedagogy is vital. So we, we can also improve our students' outcomes through enabling them to lead their own learning. The third area that we want to analyze is leadership of change. Uh, this area focuses on collaborative leadership at all levels to develop a vision for change and improvement in the school and its community. Uh, the fourth area is leadership and management of staff, because being able to empower the staff of our school will lead to well-being and positive relationships. This is really what a successful professional team is or should be. 
And finally, the, the fifth area is management of resources to promote equality, uh, because we really need to analyze if the school's management of resources will lead to build a more sustainable and equitable future for all the community. So we have been analyzing these five areas. Uh, we have been trying to identify what uh, quality really means in each of these areas. And because of that, we have selected a series of, of themes and indicators, which have, as you see also in the slide, their own features of highly effective practice. And then also some challenge questions, which are uh, related with those uh, themes or indicators. And these are the questions that will help us decide whether the objectives uh, that we have in the school are fulfilled or not. Um, the main objective finally of this tool is going to be to, to analyze or to discuss, to, to, to talk among all the teachers of the schools what is happening in the school uh, uh, because we want to make it better even, even if it is good <laughs> and especially uh, trying to find areas that, that are going to need more focus or that need to be developed or, or improved. So. Um, I would like to say thank you to everybody who is attending the panel. Um, and back to you, Mark, to see if we have any questions. Thanks very much, uh, Sarah, and thank you very much, Catalina Mercedes, as well. Just before we move on, just on Sarah's point there, just for those of you who are with us, who are part of our uh, bilingual education program, we will. I will be talking about the opportunity for you to be involved in a pilot of the the tool that Sarah has just so well described. Uh, so stay with us till the end and I'll mention that again as we come to the end because we're now at the position where we want to pilot that. Okay, well, thanks very much to our, our three speakers. Um, there are issues there which are clearly uh, common. I mean, we're talking about obviously uh, having clear objectives for, uh, for the programmes, which might be varied. We're talking about um, uh, um, a commitment of teachers and schools to um, evaluation, self-evaluation to improvement and to better learning outcomes. And then the way that obviously what we're talking about today is how to go about this and how it works at school level and at program level. We do have some questions um, that are already in, as I said, and some that are coming in uh, while we speak. So um, I think if, if you don't mind, I'm going to go, I'm going to ask them individually. I'm going to go to uh, Catherine first for the first question, but if the others want to come in, then please indicate and I'll, I'll bring you in afterwards. The first question, Catherine, is um, refers to, we've had a couple of questions which refer to uh, other languages and minority languages. So the question here that we've got is, are there additional or different issues that need to be taken into account when plurilingual, plurilingual, oh, can't speak, when plurilingual education involves a language or languages that are lesser used or minority languages. Did you catch that, Catherine, or do you want me to? No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, plurilingual education can obviously involve um, a number of different scenarios or permutations according to the languages or language varieties um, that are involved in the plurilingual project, as it were. Um, and these situations can be viewed in terms of the linguistic relationship between the languages in question, uh, their relative status as official, non-official languages in the communities we're dealing with, uh, but also the wider status and role of the languages as international languages, regional languages and so on. Um, I need to point out as well, I suppose, that the term minority needs to be handled with some caution um, as a language can be a minority language in one context and not in another one. Um, so the sociolinguistic vitality and status of the languages we're dealing with are likely to entail some interesting questions about how provision is planned and delivered, um, both from a linguistic perspective and also from an attitudinal motivation language learning rationale perspective as well, I'd suggest. Um, and one key question will be around the level of input in the language, the level of support that the language requires if learners are to be given the opportunity to develop their skills. In a context such as Wales, for example, the immersion model aims to develop the Welsh language skills of learners for whom Welsh is not one of their home languages very often. Um, in 2019 to 20, the percentage of learners in their first year of primary 
um, education, age five, um, in Welsh medium schools, speaking Welsh at home was 39%. I should note as well that that percentage varies across Wales. So this kind of situation leads to some key questions around how language provision is planned and delivered. The linguistic input um, required in an immersion setting will need to be planned in such a way that learners are provided with opportunities to acquire the range of skills they need in order to make progress towards bilingualism. And part of that planning involves decisions being made about the space that the smaller language requires in order for learners to be able to develop their skills in that language. And that then has to happen in the wider context of seeking to maximise the potential that the learners other languages could bring. Um, another dimension of the language status or language vitality question relates to how the language or languages are perceived by the learners in the world around them. That's partly a question about the linguistic landscapes that are available to learners and their lived experiences of these languages. Um, do they see the language around them in the media they consume, in the games they play, in the music they listen to? And how does that relate to their motivation for learning a language and their perceptions about the purpose of a language? and the purpose of learning a language. So these can be really important questions for those situations where there are language, where, whether there are language learning um, considerations um, to consider and where learning languages and speaking a language are linked to considerations around identity or heritage or community cohesion. So this in turn links to important questions about the strategies and approaches that may be required to engage with learners and to make language learning a meaningful experience for them. Thanks, Catherine. That's actually that's that's really interesting. I mean, this whole idea of language status and, and you call it language vitality, did you call it? I think it was a and it's a it's a really um, interesting question. Obviously, in Spain, that's going to have very different significance whether you're in the Basque country, Catalonia. Baleares or Madrid or Castilla and Leon, etc. All of that, you know, the, and that's one of the reasons I suppose why in so many of our <coughs> more successful programs we look to reproduce that in the school when it's not part of the out, outside experience. You know, so you you make the school that language learning environment that isn't necessarily available uh, outside. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I think again we may well come back to that again in a moment. But let me let me pass on now to another question that we've had, and this one is for. Um, Mercedes, if that's okay with you. Um, and this is a question about uh, in-school preparation for quality assurance. So following up, I suppose, some of the things you said uh, earlier. And this one is about training. So what kind of training would staff from teachers to leaders need in order to engage in quality assurance? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that one is easy to assume that we all know um, how to assure uh, quality assure the work that we do uh, or the work of others uh, but that is not always the case and uh, uh, what helps uh, is to have a clear idea what it is that you're looking for and what is the evidence that will help you reach a decision so the kind of training for example that i imagine will uh, take place uh, at um, uh, teacher level uh, is around uh, when i observe what is it that i'm looking for uh, if I observe a lesson, what are the indicators that will tell me uh, that there is learning? If I'm looking at uh, the work of students, um, how can I see learning over time? Uh, how can I focus on the right things if I look at data? Um, so there is a, an exercise around discussing and agreeing in teams, probably, whether it's a year team or a departmental team, what it is that good and better than good looks like. Uh, what are the indicators, the signs uh, that I will use to reach a conclusion? And if we're talking about leaders, then uh, they will be uh, quality assurance whole teams and, and possibly the whole school. Um, so how do I get away from the anecdotal um, uh, to be able to make uh, a fair assessment of uh, what the school's strengths and areas for development are? Um, so uh, it needs a fair amount of uh, reflective practice uh, and discussion and sharing 
before a common approach is developed. Um, so there is um, a professional um, judgment uh, and, uh, and good evidence uh, at the basis of any quality assurance process. Thanks, Martinez. And again, that's obviously interesting, this idea that you need to, at all levels, you need to work as a team. You can't really do this effectively individually. So you, you need that reflective practice, but you need it uh, and discussion, but you need it on a wide level across the school. Um, and I think that that's uh, for a lot of people in their schools, that's always been an issue. And that's one of the things that uh, that, that schools are, are working on um, and the sorts of things that Sarah was talking about in her school as well, which leads us nicely actually to the next question, in fact, which which is a, a very nice link, which is a question which is a slightly different angle, but more based on based on what you're doing in the school. And the question, Sarah, is what are the main areas of improvement that you have identified and are working on in your school? Sarah, you're on mute. Sorry, I can improve in working in teams. <laughs> uh, I was saying that there are, there are so many areas in which we can improve always. Uh, and as I said before, even if you are doing something very well, there is always time for rethinking and, and change. Uh, we analyze our way of working during our team meetings, uh, which normally take place uh, once per month or so. And then as usual, at the end of the course, um, we are really working really hard in improving the external projection of the British program of the school, uh, but also spreading information within the school about what we are doing and how well we're doing that, because sometimes uh, we do so many things and the rest of the community doesn't know about uh, about the things that we are doing with our students. Uh, there is also a lot of work still to be done in, in generating materials uh, which are adapted to the program itself and especially the development of cooperative work among British areas uh, with uh, project works with cross curricular activities and so on. We do it but we really want to do it better. Um, then there is also a lot of work to do if we talk about resources as well, both human and material resources. Uh, for example, uh, keeping the same teaching staff in the program so as to foster teamwork would be amazing. Reducing the number of students by hiring more teachers, improving the way we use ICT tools with the students, reorganizing with help of, of from the administration teachers' schedules to have more time to dedicate to, a cooper to cooperative work or to attend courses or receive training. So, so there is still a lot of work to do. There is always a lot of work to do in every school. And of course, that's always true, isn't it? Because, you know, even if everything's going well, it can always be better. Exactly. Um, and I think one of the things that's coming across from all of the things you're saying so far, it's not a question of saying we're not doing this well. It's a question of saying, what are we doing? How are we doing it? And what we're doing well, let's make that better. And what we're not doing well, if there is anything, let's focus on that. Yeah. Um, before I move on, does it, I don't know if that was a question that you would want to answer as well about anything you're focusing on at the moment in, in, in your school in terms of improvement. Yes, well, um, we did a, um, an exercise in self-evaluation uh, at the end of the lockdown period and uh, we're doing an assessment of the uh, the skill set of uh, of students uh, we agreed that there were some competencies that we needed to to focus on um, and uh, different parts of the school early years primary and secondary identify different kinds of competencies so that has become a key area uh, now for our uh, for our plan and so, um, I mean, it also shows that this is not pro possibly what we would have chosen uh, a year ago. Uh, it was not the plan then, but it became uh, a plan. In fact, our self-evaluation changed several times during the course of last year as the school uh, and the way we operated um, evolved. Uh, our assessment of the uh, virtual learning, uh, we had to evaluate that before we could you know, bring about improvements. And now that we've come back, we also need to see where our students are, where our communities are, where our staff uh, is in terms of uh, training and development. So um, it is a very fluid, it is a change